hello hello welcome everybody so it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague in this 5th september a teachers day and it's a great occasion and uh, this uh, special institute colloquium we have arranged because of a, a breakthrough achievement by our colleague professor mala and professor nirmal goes so without much delay let me invite professor panigrahi to the dais along with professor paul so i request professor panigrahi to greet professor paul with our bouquet so i request professor malla reddy and professor nirmal ghosh to dais and request professor pal to greet and felicitate professor malla reddy and nirmal ghosh with flowers i request all the team member of the science paper all the five students and uh, all the team members who are actually joined in the uh, uh, online so let me read out their name surajit bhuiya subham chandel somna de akash tiwari susobhan das nishkar kumar rituparna choudhury saikat mandal isita ghosh amit mandal and from iit kgp uh, sumant kumar karan and bhanu bhushan khatua so i request professor paul to say a few words yeah, i am happy to welcome all who are present here as well as those who are online for this uh, teachers day program which as you know in honor of our president ex president sarvapalli radhakrishnan uh, is celebrated as shikshak divas शिक्षक दिवस और टीचर्स डे ऑल ओवर द कंट्री इट इज अ सेलिब्रेशन ऑफ द टीचिंग एंड द टीचर्स एंड हेंस एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशन ऑल ओवर द कंट्री एज वेल एज रिसर्च लेबोरेटरीज हु ऑल्सो हैव सम काइंड ऑफ ए टीचिंग प्रोग्राम सेलिब्रेट दिस विद ग्रेट एंथुजियाजम इट ऑल्सो रिमाइंड्स आस द टीचर्स ऑफ द ग्रेट रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज दैट वी हैव to teach in a proper manner and today because of the pandemic the teaching has taken a special turn because of the online mode of teaching and that has certainly placed much bigger challenges to all of us and we continue to shoulder that responsibility continue to shoulder the challenges and the icers in particular i am very proud have stood out in the teaching of science in fact some of you may have heard the story of icers today by professor satyamurthy uh, who spoke in the morning how icers started and i think it is very important to remind ourselves that the icers started with a with a great enthusiasm to impart interdisciplinary science education i think that was a very important thing and integrate the second important aspect was to integrate research with education and i hope all of us should remind ourselves that we are doing this job 
very well and i hope all of you are doing this job very well so we gave a lot of emphasis on the research on the final year of ms program and of course teaching right through today is very special day because we are not only celebrating the teachers day but we are also celebrating two of our teachers and the students so it's really a teachers day the teachers and the student combined who have brought laurels to icr kolkata through their pro paper in science on the piezoelectric organic molecules which they will speak about the self filling materials which have a lot of potential for translation so while this talk will be presented to us and we will know what is the science part i may also remind that there is a translational opportunities which uh, we should not miss so i think obviously professor malla reddy and professor nirmal ghosh have uh, responsibilities but i think all of i sir should realize that any good work like this has a translational potential and this one has immediate translational potential i mean if not immediate its immediate is always a relative term in a reasonably short time and we should also look at that potential the paper in science of course all of you know that science is a very important journal and this happens to be the first paper in science though definitely i would expect this is not the last and i'm sure many of you will be inspired to publish papers in such journals we had papers in nature before but nature and science are very important journals along with many other journals i would say there are many many other journals in every area which are a kind of a signature journals and the icr kolkata should continue to do that and that is somehow captured in nature index and we have been doing reasonably well in nature index and we can continue to do better but these are the two signature papers so we are celebrating this year in the teachers day on this teachers day their work and i thought that the best way to celebrate is for them to speak rather than we simply say what they have done so they will actually bring out their paper in fact this was a fond hope since i knew about the paper i wanted this paper publication to be you know kind of disseminated to everybody in our in the in the institute so we waited for a right opportunity and then i am very happy that professor panigrahi and professor raj came up with the suggestions of doing it in the teach on the teachers day and when professor panigrahi first said that the teachers day presents a great opportunity i immediately said yeah why not uh if science day was closer that would have been another great option but certainly teachers day is also a great uh, a great occasion to celebrate this we also believe that with the students it's a it's a paper which is really a large collaborative effort and i think papers of this kind require collaboration we have also collaboration with iit kharagpur group as they will probably spell out but i think it's very important that the origin of the paper came from here the ideas came from here and let's celebrate this i think with this i would uh, give best wishes to all students and teachers and also the rest of the staff non teaching staff on this occasion of the teachers day 2021 and we will move ahead with the program and i'll give it to raj to continue it thank you professor pal so now we'll move to actually the technical session i request professor malla to deliver his special colloquium and after malla professor nirmal ghosh will actually deliver his part of his research
Can you hear me? Yeah, I think if you switch up the light. Okay, I think I am visible right now. Is it okay? So we are all set. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank. Uh, we have joined here and uh, Professor Paul, uh, Professor Panigrahi, and uh, Professor Raj, and my colleague uh, Nirmalo, and everyone. And so it is a great occasion uh, to meet here. So I'm happy that I'm able to share these results with all the colleagues at ISR Kolkata and uh, students here. And uh, so. So it is a, a great occasion, uh, as Professor Paul said, and uh, so it is a. So it is shared already. Hmm? Is it okay? Okay. So happy Teachers Day, everyone, uh, uh, to everyone, and uh, so uh, so uh, I would like to acknowledge all my group members. Uh, so uh, current group members and former group members and uh, my students, and then all the collaborators with whom uh, we worked earlier, ISER Kolkata, and also, uh, uh, so ISER Kolkata central facilities, you know, most of the instruments that we used are mostly from ISER Kolkata, and then funding from DST and uh, SCRB. Sorry. Uh, hmm? Again. Hello, which browser are you using? Just a minute. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yes, first of all. Please change the slide. Is it okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, sorry for the small technical glitch. Uh, so then I would thank all my funding agencies, say ISER Kolkata for providing uh, all the central facilities. Uh, you know, these are very, very useful if you want to do something, uh, you know, at, at, at an advanced level. Although we don't have every facility, but uh, we are decently placed. And then I also would like to uh, thank uh, Sensei from IIC, uh, IIC Bangalore, uh, where we do uh, did piezoelectricity related work and uh, particularly the piezo force microscopy experiments. Although we did some more experiments at uh, IIT Karakpur, so these experiments were very, very useful. So I thank uh, them for all the help. Uh, so uh, before going into the talk, uh, I must tell that you know all that we have done uh, is mainly because of the hardworking students and uh, Surajit uh, from my group and Shubham from Nirmalaya's group. So they were the and then Sumanta Karan uh, from uh, uh, IIT Karakpur from uh, Professor Banu Bhushan Katwas group. So these three uh, uh, were working from the beginning on this project, and then we really did not know how to go about it, and uh, because it was something very new in molecular crystals. 
Uh, so then they then later once we reached a stage, then others contributed, and particularly Somnath's uh, experiments with XRD were very very useful. So he proved how exactly the self healing material, uh, how good is it, uh, it is after healing, and then others have contributed, and every single member contribution was very very important and then we, since we had to do a lot of experiments using different techniques so we had to uh, you know involve a uh, lot of people and intra group collaboration as well as uh, collaborations outside the group and then we had to work together and uh, so i thank all of them and this is basically because of them and I, although myself and nirmalyo are presenting here so students are the ones uh, who actually have uh, done almost all these experiments uh, themselves. So uh, I will uh, quickly say what we have been doing so far and that should give you some uh, idea uh, about how we got into this work and so uh, so we work on the mechanical properties of molecular crystals and I will just briefly explain that then I will go into the self-healing uh, that we have published in the science paper. So most of the crystallographers actually want crystals or they grow crystals only to check the single crystal uh, structure, basically structure from the, and then once they have the structure, so they are happy. So to get a very good structure, you need a very good crystal and uh, then you need, you get very good diffraction, then you are done. So suppose if your crystal is not good and then you do get, don't get a very good diffraction pattern. So you try to ignore all those crystals which are not very good. So uh, we have large number of crystal structures in the crystal structure database now. This is a very huge number. And uh, so people wanted only the very good crystals and most of the time people have ignored the bad crystals. For example, if you see the crystals here, uh, so these are not very good. So no crystallographer would like to actually take these crystals and then go for X-ray crystallography. They always want something at least like this and then they cut in the middle and then they take the good part and then they get the structure. So people have been ignoring uh, soft crystals or which are not very straight and uh, you know rigid. So that is when uh, we got into these mechanically bendable crystals. And, uh, but most of the organic crystals, when you apply mechanical stress, they simply break, as you can see here. Uh, so this is a caffeine, co caffeine crystal. So if you apply mechanical stress, most of these organic crystals simply break. But uh, so initially, when I was uh, doing PhDs, we found some bendable crystals. And then that is how we uh, initially, uh, I got into the bendable crystals. And then uh, with Professor Gausan Deshiraju, so there we proposed a mechanism for this bending and uh, at that time it was something very new and nobody uh, really knew how these crystals actually bend, how they are different from the rest of the crystals. So uh, here if you have weak, interac weak interactions between columns, so the basically you can push and then through the weak interactions molecules slide, that is how you get the bending. So then uh, after that, after I joined at ISA Kolkata, then we wanted to actually understand uh, how at molecular level these crystals actually deform and uh, can we get some insight so that was our idea then we collaborated with uh, uh, Naomo uh, who is a very well known guy uh, in the group in the mechanical properties so then we worked together and then took some of our old crystals and then basically we looked at using synchrotron how these crystals actually uh, deform and local structure we try to understand the local structure and then mechanical properties and so on as you can see here, this is a bendable crystal. So if you apply stress, so these crystals bend like a metal wire. So then uh, we were working on the pharmaceutical solids uh, at ISR Kolkata. And uh, my first uh, batch of students, uh, Saumajit, was actually looking at co-crystals of caffeine. So then he found that actually molecular crystals can bend uh, significantly in elastic manner. For example, if you see here, uh, so this is very, very, this was very unusual at that time and nobody really uh, showed or demonstrated this. Although people knew that elasticity is common to every type of material, but what you see here is exceptionally high. And this was very, very surprising. So this we uh, published in Angevante came in uh, 2012. So this is this was a kind of a first elastic crystal in the crystallography. And then this uh, again caught attention. And then we explained the difference between plastic crystals and elastic crystals and then this, uh, the, these examples, initial examples, set the stage for discovery of various types of mechanically deformable crystals by various groups. Now, right, right now, uh, there are a lot of groups working on mechanical properties. They have different exper ex expertise. They come from different backgrounds. Now, if you see the literature, so you have various types of, for example, this is a fluorescent crystal. This is a metal organic crystal. This is also a metal organic crystal. This is the elastic one. This is from Mariana. 
and then this is uh, again by my former uh, student who was postdoc with me now in germany so he published uh, from uh, francisca's group uh, this is a metal complex so you see plastic deformation even in the metal complexes and then this is from a chinese group this is a twistable crystal which bends elastically and then these are jumping crystals nomos group again have been working on these for a long time so all these are very very interesting and as you can see here these are different manifestations of mechanical action in organic crystals so now this field is really like you know uh, uh, going very well and here this is a you know under light and this is from us if you shine light from one side the crystals actually bend if you heat it it goes back so these are the type of crystals uh, that now people are looking at and the field is really uh, going nice with a lot of interesting examples in among the molecular crystals so when we were working on mechanical properties like you know when we make some crystals always we try to check the mechanical properties so this is when uh, my student surajit found that uh, some crystals when you basically break them they again come back most of the crystals break in a brittle manner uh, when you push them very hard but when you apply gentle force he found that crystals actually spring back and then they heal completely and some of them heal so well that you can't actually distinguish or you don't see any uh, crack in the crystal so so what is self healing basically uh, self healing is very very rare if you see materials around us no material after you break it it heals on its own so this is a very very uh, interesting property but it is very very rare and it happens in biology uh, you know very efficiently and people have been trying to understand from biology so what is self healing self healing uh, materials are artificial substances that have the built in ability to automatically automatically repair damages to themselves without any external intervention so when you damage something they automatically repair because of their inherent property but you have to most of the time give some external uh, direction or you have to externally apply something for example if you look at in bone uh in the in the bone what happens when you have a crack here so uh the bone actually here electrical uh, uh, basically uh, electric potentials develop on the crack so if you see here you have normally uh, negative charge on the inner side so this uh, at, this at, actually attracts the uh, cells to the this region and these cells basically come here sorry this, uh, was something i didn't do anything okay yeah. yeah so here if you see these cells basically come here they deposit uh, calcium based uh, minerals here so because of that then basically the, you uh, have a self healing here so it is actually a mineralization process but here uh, one important thing is uh, here the charges develop and uh, so that leads to the uh, healing so uh, why do we have the charges so in the bone you have uh, collagen which is a you know uh, uh, amino acid based uh, uh, material so it is uh, made up of protein so so here uh, you have proteins and if you we, we can see these are all amino acids which are chiral so essentially you have a polar arrangement here which is a piezoelectric material that is why it has a piezoelectric nature so the bone also has piezoelectric nature when you bend it so basically on one side you develop positive charge and other side you develop negative charge so this is uh, called a plexoelectric effect or so kind of a, it is similar to be this a, a different version of piezoelectric effect you can imagine but it is not exactly same so people knew that electrical charges actually play a role uh, in healing in biomaterials and even in the tissue and in many places uh, charges have been shown to uh, help in the healing but this was not found or not studied in any other uh, unnatural or synthetic materials so that is where our study actually gained some importance and uh, if you look at uh, self healing in nature even in the plants like uh, we all know this uh, some plants they basically release latex when you basically mechanically damage and then that helps in the uh, closing of the wounds and then that actually helps in healing even in the insects if you see in this insects uh, uh, so these bisel uh, threads when they break so they heal automatically here if you see there is an interesting chemistry uh, this iron actually binds to these uh, catechol groups and then because uh, of these uh, laba uh, so here it is a very dynamic bond so it is not very strong or it is not very weak so it actually at different ph 
it, the, the bonds actually uh, formation and breakage actually is modulated and because of that uh, healing is actually uh, uh, healing is actually seen here so people have used uh, these biological uh, technique like you know the methods uh, to synthesize polymers with a similar kind of groups and then they have actually seen that it is possible to translate some of these things that you see in the biology to unnatural material so that is why if you have a uh, mechanism you know if you understand some mechanism and you can actually translate it to some other material so this is where uh, very important so if you understand something uh, from the nature you can always translate it into soft, uh, other unnatural material so that is why each mechanism uh, any new mechanism that you propose or uh, show is very very important and uh, then again if you look at uh, some this example so what scientists have done uh, he is that from illinois, university of illinois urbana champion so they have taken a polymer liquid and they uh, under these uh, when this monomer comes in contact uh, with this catalyst so it forms a polymer so they embedded uh, these uh, liquid uh, as bubbles and uh, uh, so then, uh, then you have some catalyst. Uh, as you see, these uh, small dots are actually catalyst here on the left hand side, and the big ones are actually uh, the bubbles with the solvent, uh, with the monomer. When you have a crack, so this runs through both the, this brings both catalyst and uh, monomer solution into uh, surface of the crack, and then that uh, leads to uh, reaction, and because of that reaction. Uh, so actually the uh, gaps are closed or uh, you know you have a kind of a healing here so this is uh, uh, this again is a new mechanism that they proposed and then it was uh, uh, this helps you to make uh, polymers with self healing property again people have shown that you can also use interesting chemistry uh, so as you can see here somehow my mouse is not moving yeah so so on the left hand side if you see there is a urea type of bond, uh, molecule and uh, on that molecule you have a uh, hydrocarbon uh, group actually tertiary butyl group so once you put these groups so these bonds again become very weak and then you can easily form them and break them uh, break them and form them and then that helps in the healing when you crack this material because of the stress so you might have some uh, deformed bonds there when you bring the material again in contact so again this uh, uh, basically you will see you see the self healing so as you can see on the right hand side you have the video uh, here the self healed material after uh, during the compression so it holds very nicely and then uh, it shows a very nice healing again here uh, the material this material is very very soft right so almost all these materials are soft wherever you see the self healing this is another example it is again a polymer which is very soft and then uh, people also have shown the self healing in gels hydrogels these uh, gels coated coated with the different color also heal uh, in the hydro uh, in, in in a buffer solution as you can see so this is but this is again a very soft material and people also have taken these polymers and coated uh, nanoparticles with these self healing polymers and made uh, sheets and even these sheets when you cut so they actually uh, show nice uh, uh, self healing as you can see here if you put these two pieces together again so they uh, nicely uh, self heal and uh, so self healing uh, basically is a uh, very important and but it mostly happens in soft materials and then and most of these materials are also amorphous as you can see here so it nicely holds but it takes uh, like normally it takes hours uh, to achieve the self healing and uh, so it uh, happens in mostly uh, uh, soft materials and then amorphous type of material but self healing in crystalline materials was almost like unknown okay nobody has shown self healing until very very recent time uh, but self healing is very difficult in crystals because crystals are very stiff fragile and rigid and uh, diffusion is also very difficult in most of the other mechanisms so diffusion is one of the main mechanisms but here in single crystals because they have a dense packing so because of that molecules cannot move and then uh, rejoin at the place of the uh, crack so that is uh, it is very difficult and then you also don't have proper characterization tools to really understand the self feeling this is where uh, nirmalius work was very very helpful we could actually characterize and see how nicely the uh, how, how nicely the crystals heal so one uh, a group uh, showed that you know crystals can heal under buffer solution so this this was published in nature 
Uh, so they took a bio uh, macromolecular crystal hybrid. So this is a kind of a hybrid of a protein and a polymer, and uh, it has a lot of water in it. And when you put it in buffer solution, and it develops cracks and it swells, and then you change the concentration of the buffer, then again it shrinks. But each time you see the cracks uh, emerge and then they disappear on their own. So this is again. Uh, it is in crystals, but this is in buffer, and then you have a lot of diffusing solvent in this case. So that helps. So, but most of the organic crystals don't uh, have solvent, right? So they are highly crystalline. They are also rigid. So then, in that case, it becomes very difficult. So this again, uh, self healing was shown in organic crystals, as you can see here. So here, the sulfur-sulfur bond is dynamic, so it can easily form and break. They have used the principles from the polymers and then tried to show the self healing. But here, if you see, the self healing is only 7%, and you see a big crack here on the crystal. So it is not really uh, uh, that, uh, that much efficient. But uh, still, uh, this is very important because uh, nothing was known in the organic crystal. So they try to show that you know it can be done. And on the other one, on the right hand side, uh, you have a, uh, uh, another molecule where, again, self healing is seen. But again, you see a big crack. And these crystals also lose the crystallinity. But in terms of cell feeling, it is 67%. But in terms of crystallinity, uh, it doesn't retain very good crystallinity, although they could not, uh, because of lack of techniques, so they could not really characterize how much cell feeling is seen uh, in terms of crystallinity. Because for crystalline materials, uh, crystallinity is the most important part, not the mechanical uh, strength, because you are not going to, most of the time, use these crystals for uh, uh, load bearing, right? For polymers, it is very important, mechanically. But for crystals, the most important thing is uh, crystallinity. So that is, uh, you techniques to do this, and this is where Nirmalio's work is uh, was very very important. And so uh, we got into these crystals. Rajit was working on uh, these bipyrazole molecules, and then we found that uh, he found that these crystals break in a brittle manner. But when you apply the stress in a gentle fashion, like you know, push a little bit. As you can see, this is a crystal here. Uh, so it uh, breaks. These block objects are actually uh, needle uh, metal pins, and you're pushing from the right side. And uh, you have a big crack, as you can see here. And then once you release the stress, so it uh, crack completely, and the pieces come on their own. But almost all feeling materials, you have to put the uh, broken pieces together, and then leave them together uh, for some stress or, or you know you have to uh, otherwise you have to have chemical reaction so here it comes pieces come uh, back on their own and healing is also so efficient here as you can see here the crack goes on its own and also when it heals it is uh, almost like flawless and this is what is uh, striking here and this was uh, not seen uh, in other materials and also it happens very very fast it is within a less uh, uh, less than a second actually what you see here so it could be probably milliseconds, but we, we don't have, uh, you know, uh, we see that it is around in milliseconds, but it is very, very fast. And this, again, the time scales are also very, very uh, important. So then we wanted to know, like, how, how these are able to come uh, on their own together. And then, as you can see here, uh, this crystal actually uh, jumps uh, and then moves very fast when it uh, tries to heal. So this is, again, uh, uh, as you can see here also, these crystals basically come together and then try to attach to each other. As you can see, uh, it, they go very fast, they jump, and then they actually try to uh, organize themselves to uh, then again come back and then actually heal. So that is what is uh, happening in these crystals. So then we wanted to see if there is any attraction here. So then uh, uh, Surajit uh, took these crystals and then uh, pushed them together after breaking. And as you can see here, this uh, piece jumps and then goes and gets attached to the other piece. So this says that there is an attraction, and then that attraction actually leads to the healing. As you can see here on the right side, so you break a crystal, and then you leave the take withdraw the force, and then it heals on its own, and then the crack is totally uh, gone. So, so this happens when you have a perfect healing. But sometimes you, uh, many times actually you uh, you see a crack. But when it heals perfectly, so you don't see any crack. So that is what is very, very uh, interesting. And then uh, in the real time, if you see uh, here, so it's, uh, it, you, you almost miss it, right? So if you do it, uh, check it under high speed camera. And then as you can see, the crack develops. And then when you withdraw the force, it go, uh, crack actually closes on its own. 
and then this closes so so precisely and nicely you don't see any sign of crack anywhere you we checked it under tm uh, we, we, sorry sem and uh, we checked it under uh, optical microscope and afm but we did not find any sign of the crack after uh, it heals completely so these are the same images so you don't see any healing in this case so then we wanted to see what is the origin and why exactly you have healing here and if you look at the crystal structure uh, here you have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions okay so since you have both hydrophobic uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions uh, so uh, in most of the other self healing materials so it was also seen that uh, if we have both hydrogen bonding interactions and uh, hydrophilic interactions it helps in healing and that is what we also see and here another important thing uh, here is that it is a polar crystal and uh, it is a piezoelectric uh, space group so then uh, we thought we should also explore the piezoelectricity in these crystals and uh, and then that uh, helped us to understand why these crystals actually attract and then come close and heal so if you see here uh, so this is the piezoelectric uh, uh, mechanism uh, if you take any piezoelectric material and then compress them or if you apply stress so it develop uh, electrical charges so these electrical charges actually give you the uh, uh, you know uh, current and uh, so this uh, but when your uh, recovery is 100% if if once you apply the stress and re, uh, withdraw the stress if it is basically uh, a completely an elastic material then you don't have any remnant charge so it completely goes away and but if it is if you have some plastic deformation you are bound to have some remnant charges on the surfaces so that is what uh, we feel in our case uh, is happening and that is what is probably leading to the uh, charges on the remnant charges on the surfaces and which help us to uh, gain the, uh, the you know close the gap so that is what is probably happening so then we did the piezoelectric uh, piezoelectricity measurements uh, using the pfm and uh, also uh, using the piezometry at iit kharagpur and then all this basically uh, suggests that this is a nice piezoelectric crystal and uh, then we also wanted to see on the surface uh, whether you have charges so then we did kpfm measurements at iis bangalore and then we found that when you break this crystal and then remove this part and then see here on this surface so you have a electrical potential here electrical charge so this electrical charge is uh, quite large it is uh, average electrical charge uh, is the pot surface potential that you see here is plus 4.72 volts uh, so this was on the higher side but many of them other crystals showed little less and then on the left side uh, you see that you know that is a negative charge so you have either positive surface potential or negative surface potential on the crystal so that means uh, when you break the crystal so you have on one side positive charge and other side negative charge so if you have a crack in the crystal then you see that on one side you have negative charge on the other side you have positive charge this tells that the two surfaces are actually oppositely charged so these opposite charges uh, allow these crystals to come closer and then basically uh, close the gap and then uh, heal so as you can see here you have positive and negative charges on two surfaces and then this this actually helps the crystals to uh, uh, basically close and then heal very fast so how good is the healing so then we wanted to understand whether the healing is good or not this is where there are no other techniques and uh, so we looked at with the x-ray crystallography we after healing uh, we took these crystals very nicely healed crystals and then we mounted them in the diffractometer here with us and we looked at the crystal structure and uh, we did not find any sign even in the diffraction pattern uh, when we looked at uh, especially when you solve the crystal structure so it, they look as good as the pristine crystal so we did not find any sign so this x-ray is not a very good technique to actually know local uh, changes but this gives you an average of the uh, average information because x-ray is an averaging technique so that is why we could not find much but this says that for the purpose of crystallography uh, the healing that we see is very very good so but if there is a crack in the crystal then we saw that you know you have a split peaks and then that uh, uh, this these split peaks basically tell you that the healing is not very good in that case whenever you see the crack the two domains are actually uh, misaligned so that is why you see uh, uh, split peaks here so then comes uh, the uh, part of nirmalo so here they basically since we could not uh, assess the local order so then we wanted to see uh, with nirmalo so we were discussing on 
uh, you know, some uh, his technique and then we were discussing our work. So then he said that this would be very nice and we can explore. So that is how we got into this. And then when we uh, did all these experiments, we found that uh, in the pristine crystals, you know, the order is, uh, for example, if you take that as a standard, then in the neatly healed crystal, the order is only like uh, is uh, 15 to 20 percent lower. Okay, so roughly uh, an, an average. But when you go to the imperfectly healed crystal, so the order it actually drops significantly. So that tells that when the when you have a very nice the uh, in terms of the crystallinity, it is about 80 to 80 percent of the healing with respect to the crystallinity. Although it looks perfect uh, with other techniques. So here we could at the nano scale we could see that you know this healing is about uh, 80 to 85 percent and then in case of a uh, imperfectly healed crystal where you see the crack so the crystallinity drops by 50 percent so this technique allowed us to actually quantify Nirmalio is going to talk about the details how exactly it is done and all that he is going to explain uh, here so this is a summary like uh, uh, if you have a neatly healed crystal so you have 80 to 85 percent uh, healing and uh, then uh, if you just fragment the crystals, so it is little better. But if the healing is not very good, if you have a crack, so that drops by 50%. So then uh, we also have other examples and uh, following this model, so we also search for other examples. We could also see the same kind of uh, healing in other examples. I'm not going into the details, but all the piezoelectric uh, crystals are not going to show this because for example, if you see here, so this is a L histidine, this is amino acid. So in this case, we did not find the piezoelectric effect because we did not see any attraction. Here, you these crystals are very, very stiff and then you have strong hydrogen bonds. You don't have hydrogen uh, mix, the, you know, the, this is not a, it does not allow plasticity. So uh, because of that, probably in this case, we did not see the cell feeling. So this tells that we need to understand more and uh, so more details are required and we need to study more examples to fully understand so where can we use uh, probably these uh, you know these dynamic crystals for example the mechanism that we proposed could be uh, very uh, could also explain uh, the self healing in some of the biomaterials for example if you see most of the biological materials like uh, microtubules uh, uh, and other biological materials they are all they all pack in the polar arrangement Okay, so since you also have polar arrangement in these biomaterials, so if you cut these materials, uh, we might see these uh, charge separation that might be also playing a role in healing of some of these biomaterials. So uh, this this but this has to be checked. But uh, there is uh, we see that you know there is a good correlation, especially these are all uh, also piezoelectric in nature because they have a polar arrangement, so they fall in the piezoelectric uh, structure category. So there should be probably uh, also similar mechanism playing a role. So then in the pharmaceutical industry also, uh, when you break particles, you may develop a lot of charges, okay, and the particles, so that also can be explained through some of the mechanisms, uh, mechanism that we looked at. So here it could be useful, and then some of these materials could be uh, very useful, you know, self healing materials could be, or other type of mechanical, uh, you know, res mechanically responsive crystals that we study in our group could be useful in uh, soft robotics and uh, many other applications. So with this, I conclude. I think uh, I have taken a long time, so I hand over it to Nirmalyo. And uh, so Nirmalyo. Uh, Nirmalyo is going to talk about the Muller matrix and then explain how we actually quantified uh, uh, the self-healing in these materials. So there is some problem with the mouse sometimes. Yeah. Let me just stop it. No, I think this uh, computer is probably hanging. I don't
So this mouse I can use or yeah. Okay, so thank you again, yeah. Marla. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marla, and yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and wish you all a very happy Teachers' Day. And it's really a great honor for us to present our work in this uh, special occasion. I would like to thank Professor Paul to give us this wonderful opp opportunity to speak on Teachers' Day. I would also like to thank Professor Panigrai and Professor Raj uh, for uh, organizing this. And of course, uh, Malla has already uh, talked about uh, his one, uh, magical self-healing crystals and also indicated about uh, the, the potential mechanism for self-healing that is piezoelectricity. Uh, in simple words, piezoelectricity, of course, arises that if you apply pressure, uh, the, particularly in the polar uh, molecules or polar systems, the pyrogon and dipoles tend to align themselves and give you macroscopic polarization. And that actually, in this case, uh, leads to generation of surface charges, which uh, we were thinking uh, as a self-healing mechanism. So the next task was, of course, to understand this and to get further insight into it. So that's what I have uh, written here, that this micros macroscopic polarization changes in the periodic response to probe through the microscopic structural anisotropy. So that is what I will talk about. So that's what the title is, Proving Self-Healing Behavior of Piezoelectric Molecular Crystals Using Polarized Light. So I have uh, made a statement here that a combination of a unique polarization mirror matrix microscopy system and inverse analysis model enable quantitative understanding and insight, that's important, on the self-healing mechanism through the microscopic optical anisotropy parameter. So that is what I'm going to explain in the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, in the process, I will also talk about a little bit, as Malla was saying, uh, the specialized uh, polarization measurement system and some new analysis that we have done. So I would, of course, like to keep it uh, in a general level, and I would like to avoid all technicalities. But sometimes some technicalities may come in, but I will try to reduce it. Okay, let me uh, first introduce our group a little bit uh, about the research of our group. So this is Bio-Optics and Nanophotonics Research Group, BioNAP Research Group uh, group at DPS, that is Department of Physical Sciences at ISR Kolkata. We, of course, work mostly in the domain of optics and photonics, and particularly uh, most emerging areas in the photonic, like spin orbit interaction of light, plasmonic, various aspects of plasmonics, quantum weak measurements. And we also intend to develop various uh, optical and photonic devices at the same time. So polarization optics this is what is related to this, is a core research area. And we uh, try to develop novel experimental systems, new algebra analysis, et cetera. And then we apply it in the domain of nano-optics and also in this bio and interdisciplinary photonics. This particular work, of course, falls in the domain of this uh, interdisciplinary photonics. So as Malla was saying, let me just uh, uh, tell that from our group, as Malla already told, that uh, Subham, Dr. Subham Chandal, right now, uh, he is in EPFL. So he was our PhD student, of course. So he was primarily involved with, of course, Surojit. These two, as Malla said, took the initiative initially. And two of our master students that time, uh, Akash Tiwari and Niskar Kumar. So we were doing masters in DPS and physical sciences. So they also got involved. In fact, their master series was mostly on these polarization studies. And of course, Surujit uh, also contributed hugely to these polarization measurements. And uh, of course, as Malla said, that we had some collaboration with uh, uh, Vivi Katwa, Professor Vivi Katwa at IIT Kharagpur. So this is our current students uh, and our research group. We, of course, have many collaborations in India and abroad. And also within IISR, we have many collaborators at uh, DPS itself and DCS, particularly in chemical sciences. We have many collaborators. Let me now uh, move on to the uh, talk. So, and basically, I will start with a very elementary uh, concept of this optical anisotropy in this kind of crystals and try to see the connection between this optical anisotropy and this piezoelectric origin of self healing. So, that's what was our primary goal. So, optical anisotropy per se actually refers to the directional anisotropy of, uh, as seen by light, basically, directional anisotropy of polarizability or susceptibility of matter as seen by light or rather by the polarization of light. So polarization is actually uh, defined by the electric field of light, right? So in an isotropic system, so polarizability is always in the direction of the uh, polarization that you are using. That is the induced polarization is in the same direction as the polarization of light. But in an isotropic system, uh, this is not the case. 
particularly in case of the crystalline systems like this, where the structural order and organized uh, structural testing leads to some anisotropies. And particularly, uh, you can see it in a very simple way, like think like that, that all the bound and the free charges in the system are not isotropically distributed. So in these systems, uh, as I said, that the induced polarization and the applied polarization of light are all not in the same direction. And they can be written like a tensorial form like that. So here, D here I have written as the displacement vector. E is the electric polarization of light. And this is what we call a dielectric tensor of rank two. So in Cartesian space, three-dimensional Cartesian space, you typically uh, write it like this. Although you can have of diagonal entries, but you can write it in so-called uh, principal coordinates in diagonal like this, where these quantities epsilon x, epsilon y, and epsilon z, which are the dielectric permittivities, so they are different. So they are the manifestation of anisotropy. When we talk about light, so we talk about the refract index of a material. So everything we quantify through this quantity refract index, which is uh, related to this dielectric constant by this, that is root over of this. So uh, in context of refract index, this can be seen like that that when light propagates in such crystalline material, like this one, so what light sees is a variation of the refract index in depending on the direction. Usually you see a ellipsoid of like this. So if you see in the three-dimensional Cartesian space, the refract index variation is like an ellipsoid. So let us see this. Let's say, for, the, for example, if I have a light going through this, which I have drawn like wave normal, and if I draw a plane perpendicular to this, uh, uh, perpendicular to this direction of propagation, it will cut this ellipsoid in an intersection ellipse. And the semi-major and the semi-minor axis of this ellipse are the refractive indices seen by the polarization of light. So that is what we call an anisotropy. So this particular crystal, as uh, Malla was telling, is a bipedal crystal. It has a tetragonal unit cell, as Malla has already shown. This tetragonal unit cell has an anisotropy related to it. In the AB direction of the crystal, as Malla was showing, the molecular tracking are like isotropic. Whereas in the C direction, which is the crystallographic direction, there are those uh, basically water chain, uh, running water chain, which gives rise to these permanent dipoles. And therefore, that is different. And that is the source of the anisotropy here. And this is what we call an uniaxial type anisotropy. And all the interesting stuff, that is the piezoelectric response, originate from those permanent dipoles running through this C axis, right? So it is therefore to be expected that those changes that appear when you apply pressure, that will be reflected in the microscopic anisotropy parameter because that C axis happens to be the optical anisotropy axis also. So this optical anisotropy axis, if you have a, one such optical anisotropy axis, we call it uniaxial system. In case of uniaxial system, what happens is that uh, this ellipsoid will turn into a spheroid. Of course, for isotropic system, it will become a sphere. That is, if you go in all directions, you see the same refract index. And in that case, you have only one direction of propagation of wave like that. Let's say this axis now, C axis I'm telling. So then if you draw a perpendicular to that, you will make a circle. This ellipse will turn, in, uh, turn into a circle. So there will be no anisotropy. So this kind of system, as I said, uh, this particular bipedal crystal that Malla is working on, E has a tetragonal unit cell, so they have kind of an uniax and anisotropy, which is uh, why uh, we thought that we will kind of work on it. Right? So that was the basis that we thought that all the important or interesting piezoelectric responses that runs through this C axis, comes through this C axis, which happens to be the optical anisotropy axis also. So it is possible to probe that. So that was the basis of our initial thoughts. And then of course, as I said, that if light propagates along the direction of this optic axis, that is the C axis, there will be no anisotropy. So that's what you do not want. So what we do is that we take the crystal in this form so that light goes straight and the polarization of the light sees this anisotropy axis. So that is the typical arrangement that we will do. So uh, I would just like to quickly define this anisotropy parameter, which are later on used as some of those Malla was already showing. So I'll just quickly define those. So if you have a plane wave description of electric field like this, you have a refract index, as I said, can have both real and imaginary parts. So easily you can see the real part of the refractive index will be related to the phase of the light. Whereas imaginary part of the refractive index is related to attenuation of light. 
So if there is an anisotropy in refract index, so there will be anisotropy in both phase and amplitude or phase and attenuation. So there are these two anisotropy parameters that which we will be uh, using frequently and their images will show. One is phase and anisotropy, which we call retardance delta, which is just simply this phase patch, 2 pi by lambda into different in refract index. And this amplitude anisotropy, which is difference in the attenuation. So this is what we measure basically. So how do we measure it? So this particular linear uniaxial system, like this crystal, actually fits something what we call Stokes Muller formalism, which is very easily can be done in terms of when we do in let's say in free space can be done easily. So this fits uh, the so-called Stokes Muller formalism. I'll quickly uh, show you that how you can measure that. So this is what that if you want to define the state of polarization of light, you can take you many of you know that you can take a polarizer and a detector. And you can place your polarizer in the horizontal direction and vertical direction. And you record the intensities of this horizontal and vertical. Add them, you get the total intensity. You subtract them, that means IH minus IV. So you get one component. So this is one Stokes vector component. Then you place it at 45 degree and minus 45 degree. And you take a difference of them. So then you get this another quantity. So it is Q, U. And the last one for that, you need to put a wave plate and then you take a difference of left and right circularly polarized light. So these four together describe any polarization state that you want. For example, completely unpolarized light will not see any variation when you rotate the polarizer. So it will be like 1, 0, 0. Horizontally polarized light will be 1, 1, 0, 0, and so on and so forth, right? So what is important and easy is that when such a polarized light fall on an anisotropic system like this crystal, so they will change the state of polarization because of the anisotropy. Isotropic system will, of course, not. So this can be represented by a simple vector algebra. That is, S0 is the output Stokes vector. M is the so-called matrix here. SI is the input Stokes vector. So this matrix M is a four cross four matrix. It only records intensity. So it is an intensity matrix. And it contains all the information about the anisotropy parameters. So I have kind of tried to mark it differently. So there are three different anisotropy parameters. So two different anisotropy parameters. One I said phase anisotropy. So by the blue mark and the amplitude anisotropy by the green mark. So this um, matrix, as I said, that they are basically some group of intensities. They actually show certain symmetries. And this symmetries arises because all these effects, like this retardance effect I'm talking about, the bijectrine effect, can be actually thought about like a rotation in this uh, Stokes vector space, can be given by some rotation kind of effect. So they have certain symmetries, which we will say, see later on, that they have some important implication in context to this analysis. So of course, that is this orientation of the uh, this diatonator and the iterator, which are useful later on, we'll see. OK, so what, has, what was our task then? As Malla has shown, that uh, in a piezoelectric crystal, particularly this kind of system where you have a polar piezoelectric crystal, Typically, uh, these polar domains there have a statistical tendency to become stay random. But when you apply perturbation, like you apply pressure, they tend to organize themselves, they tend to change their magnitude so that a macroscopic polarization is introduced. This macroscopic polarization is related to the stress that you give to the crystal. Again, this is like a tensorial relationship. So like this. So here sigma, uh, I have written here like that, that this is a stress written in a uh, six component vector, like a Coulomb vector and PI are the induced polarization, but they are, these are basically macroscopic polarization. So our task was to probe this change is macroscopic polarization through this microscopic change in the anisotropies, which is trace induced anisotropy. So the problem was that, as I said, that the uh, origin of those anisotropy of the uh, of those are of, of course those unit cells, but the dimension of the unit cells are very small, right? They're less than a nanometer. So what you ideally want is that to do a measurement in the nanometric scale. Otherwise, it may so happen that you do a measurement with, let's say, in a millimeter size spot, and all the information that you want to gather, that actually get completely randomized, and you get nothing. So this was a bit of a challenge, right? Because you have to do in nanometers, and of course, you cannot do in one nanometer, which is limited by the diffraction of light. So this was a bit of a challenge, because see, all these algebra, quantification, et cetera, we are talking about, they are ideally valid for plane wave-like situations. Here, things will be a little complicated because you will need very high numerical aperture imaging. So that means you have very tight focusing. And that may lead to some kind of things like that, scrambling of polarization. So this is what we call non-ideal polarization behavior, which cannot be truly described by this kind of Stokes-Muller algebra directly, right? 
and there will be a lot of crosstalks and blurring that uh, matrix that I was showing that I was trying to identify this is diatomaceous and this is retardants, they may get blurred. So this is what uh, will lead to difficulties in interpretation and quantification. So this uh, problem of course we addressed using a custom design system, a calibration method and some kind of inverse analysis which we have done here. So I'll uh, slowly, uh, I mean I'll try to give at least an overview of that. So this system of course we developed uh, over a few years. Uh, which is uh, what we call a Muller matrix system integrated to a dark field microscope. I'll tell what is that and what is the advantage of that. So of course we have been working on uh, developing various strategies for uh, recording Muller matrix. It is a four cross four matrix, intensity matrix. So you need 16 measurements. So what you do here is that you use a polarizer and a wave plate and you generate four different states which we optimized earlier. So this will be four different elliptical states and the sample will be here. So here is your condenser, which will actually now uh, focus. Right? This is the microscope part. And then uh, you have an objective which will collect, collect the light from the sample. And it will again be analyzed by a combination of those same polarization optical elements. Again, four states. So you have 16 measurements. So you can record both spectra. That means you can put a spectrometer here, or you can record images. So in this case, of course, we recorded images for a se selected wavelength. So this was of course developed in house. So this particular microscope uh, that we use is particularly useful for this kind of polarization measurements in nanometric samples. So this is not a conventional microscope. In conventional microscope, you see everything in white background. Here everything you see in dark background. That is because you use a condenser which is uh, central portion is blocked. So the light comes in an annular shape. It will miss that objective. So everything will be dark. No light will go into the objective. As soon as you place the sample here, the light that interacts with the sample will only enter the objective. And therefore, we get an image of the object only which has passed to the object. So this is particularly useful for the polarization measurement because sometimes it may happen that you have a lot of light coming which does not have a polarization signal, but only the sample scattered light has a very weak polarization signal. So you may miss that. So that is what uh, we tackle this. And this is particularly useful for this kind of measurement. So this I do not go into the details, I just uh, quickly say that what you do is that you cycle the input state to four states, write it form of a column matrix, a column vector, and uh, so four is basically each has a Stokes vector, so you have a four cross four matrix for both what we call the analyzer matrix and the generator matrix. And then if you know the systems analyzer and the generator matrix, you can actually work out the Muller matrix, that's what we do. We use a very intelligent kind of calibration method which automatically find out that analyzer and the generator matrix of the system. That, that's what is advantageous in this sense. But what is important as I was saying that what was challenging here is that to quantify uh, these parameters with nanometer resolution you need something more. So that's what we did using an inverse analysis model which also I will not go into the details but I will just give the philosophy. So let me just tell you that of course this system uh, with not this kind of high numerical aperture, slightly lower numerical aperture we use for many of our studies in the domain of um, optics in screen photonic effects like for polarization controlling of fan resonance, quantum weak measurements, spin orbit interaction of light, etc. But we never used for such anisotropy imaging with nanoscale spatial resolution. So this was the demand here. So to do that, to check that whether what kind of specialization we, uh, we can obtain, we did measurements on some of our samples that we fabricated for other purposes, which is called let's say nano disk array which we fabricated here using our lithography facility. So this is an ACM image of this. We can see that these uh, typical dimensions are of the order of 200 nanometers and the spacing of the order of 500 nanometers. So you can easily resolve those. So that's what we got the typical resolution that this is a polarization image of course. So you can get which is uh, of the order of or greater than actually greater than 300 nanometers. So now I quickly uh, so this I will not go into the details, I just want to say the philosophy that how you can decouple that and how you can quantify that. So as I said that uh, Mueller matrix is nothing but uh, say arrangement of different intensities or differences, uh, differences of polarized component of intensities. So you can, well, I propagates through that, this propagation you can model through by a simple differential equation. Like this dm dz is equal to m m. This small matrix m, see this small m, matrix small m, is therefore a matrix, not an exponent just. You know? So this matrix, is called the differential matrix. And the exponential of this matrix is actually the Muller matrix. So these small, mat the small m matrix contains all the polarization effects, microscopic polarization effects in these various elements. Like I have tried to note here that 
by refringence or retardance between horizontal and vertical is in this element. Plus 45 and minus 45 in these elements. And so on. Then circular by refringence is in this element. So if I find out this small small m matrix, then I can get directly quantify this. So that is one thing. One good thing is there is that they have certain symmetries rather than uh, symmetry. These are anti symmetries. Like right? so, this is plus minus plus minus, right? And this originate, as I said before, that this originate due to the fact that you can model these effects by some rotations in the closed vector space. So when you have ideal system, you get exact symmetries like this, or rather anti symmetries like this. But we, when you have non-ideal system, like you are hitting the system from different angles, arbitrary different angles, this symmetry is broken. Then you have a lot of scrambling of those symmetries. So this particular thing we use to actually eliminate those non-ideal polarization. How do we do it? We do a simple trick. So this, you see this matrix is exponential of this gives you matrix. So what we want is that we record the Muller matrix M and we just take a natural logarithm of that. And then we decompose it into low range anti-symmetric and low range symmetric part. And the low range anti-symmetric part is what gives you the ordered system. That means the ideal system. And all the polarization scrambling effects are decoupled in the low range anti-symmetric part. So then we can quantify these three important parameters, the retardance delta, orientation that is very important as I will show, orientation of the by refringence that is of those microscopic domains, and the diatonation, which is the amplitude and isotopy. So this is what um, we could do, that we could actually, we tested it, that it works in actually uh, separating out those polarization scrambling effects. So now I'll quickly uh, go into the final results at some uh, Malla also showed something, and I saw that what it implies in terms of its uh, insight into the mechanism. So this is just a typical example of what you record. So this is a dark field image of this crystal. Some heterogeneities are there, of course, because there are some um, some some uh, inhomogeneities which scatters. So we have to choose a homogeneous region. So this is a typical uh, Mueller matrix that you record image at a particular wavelength. And of course, you see a lot of diagonal en entries, and they are very strong. So that itself uh, says that you have both amplitude and phase energy, and it's a very strong amplitude and phase energy from this crystal. But as I was saying, that those, those symmetries are completely destroyed here. I mean, at least we cannot make out the plus, minus, minus, plus. And then we do this simple uh, uh, decomposition into symmetric and anti symmetric part. You get beautiful uh, anti symmetries here. This yellow portion is blue here, blue, yellow is. Uh, blue here, so that's that's exactly what you uh, should have when you have ideal system. And then this is uh, now uh, quantified further to get the parameters. So this is what uh, I am showing you the parameter for a pristine crystal. Pristine means which is not broken. And then you actually uh, break it by applying mechanical stress and it heals automatically. So this is the one which is neatly healed. In some cases, if there is some obstacle, it does not neatly heal. So that is a misalignment and they, they do not heal. So this is the images that is D and delta with, of course, sub micron scale resolution of these parameters. This immediately tells you that in these two, you have very high values of D and delta, right? So that means it has high strong order compared to this region. So particularly in the region around the crack region, what we call, we used to call that is the crack line. You have a large reduction in the structural order in the impact perfectly healed crystals. So this is very clear in this uh, also. This is what I said, there is a very important uh, thing is this orientation of those microscopic and isotropic domains, right? So this shows in the pristine crystal nice order. Like you can see, it does not only have order in the small region, but also it has a long range crystalline order. It's all nicely oriented. And after healing, it almost recovers that. There are certain uh, some variations, but it almost recovers that. If you look at the improperly healed one, you can clearly see that, particularly in the crack junks, and there are a lot of disorganization. So this actually tells that uh, these small microscopic domains of anisotropy are disorganized in the improperly held crystals. So using that, we could quantify uh, in a small region across that crack junction, because you have to identify the crack region that we do did uh, some special correlation analysis to find out the crack region between the pristine and the healed. And it actually gave usually a healing efficiency of the order of 85%, as Malla had told, maybe sometime 82%, sometime 85%, sometime it will be more also in general. But in the, uh, in the imperfectly healed crystal, there was a large reduction in particular in the crack cancer. So this was about 60% decrease. So this uh, told us about, of course, uh, the quantitative, uh, this thing about the healing, but there are two more important things which actually gave a clue to the healing mechanism. One is that we identified that in this uh, imperfectly healed crystals, 
the magnitude of this NSW parameters were low because you were already doing some averaging over the domain. Because as I said, that if you think about those unit cell, tetragonal unit cell, they are actually small. But you are already some average doing some averaging. And this special averaging with randomly oriented misaligned anisotropic domains leads to reduction of these parameters, which we confirmed by averaging smaller matrices over a large region. So they give the same tendency. Second one is more important. What we did uh, is that, of course, uh, they also measured uh, the Kelvin probe uh, microscopy measurement also shows uh, surface potential. At the same time, these two fragmented crystals were measured separately. And of course, the pristine crystal. These also le uh, led to a large reduction in the anisotropy. That even after they are broken and separated, they showed reduction in the anisotropy. And this tells you an important clue, which is this that decrease in the structural order in the microscopic building units due to the strain, which is important because that's what we are saying that there is some strain which may be remaining when even if you uh, taking it apart. This strain leads to permanent defects which leads to reduction in the microscopic anisotropy. This effect, we call it a photoelastic effect. We all know that, that if you have some isotropic material or some anisotropic material, if you apply pressure, they not only show piezoelectric effect, but also show changes in the optical anisotropy. So this is exactly what is happening. So this also is written like a uh, tensorial form. So this SK is a strain written again like a column vector 1 cross 6 form, like a vector. And left hand side, now you have the dielectric tensor, change in the dielectric tensor. So this strain actually changes also, not only that strain changes, uh, give you the piezoelectric effect, this also changes the dielectric tensor itself. How it is manifested? Like this, as I was showing you the index ellipsoid earlier, so it may so happen that this change will lead to a deformation of the index ellipsoid. For example, in this case, this was a propagation direction and this N1 and N2 uh, are the two refract indices seen by the two polarization. So by difference is N1 minus N2. So this get changed to N1 prime, N2 prime. And that leads to a reduction in these parameters. So this is coupled to the thing, uh, fact that these changes in the microscopic building blocks leads also to a change in the permanent dipoles orientation or magnitudes which result in a macroscopic polarization. That is what is leading to the, uh, that is what is observed in the KPFA measurement as the surface potential. So this suggests that, so this, uh, we tend to write it like this, this change in the structural order in the microscopic building blocks due to strain, some strain, strain uh, due to possibly as uh, Malla mentioned that some degree of plus plasticity involved in it, it leads to, of course it is manifested as a reduced anisotropy through photoelastic effect but it also changes the macroscopic polarization and generation of surface charges as observed by the KPFM measurements. Now when it efficiently heals, so this strain which is actually stored here, they are slowly released. And that release will lead to restoration of native anisotropy, anisotropy through again photoelastic effect. That is exactly what we observe. So that actually confirms this, that when there is a perfect healing, then of course this strain is released to a great extent. And that should lead to increase in the anisotropy, that's exactly what you observed and that we could quantify also. And inefficient healing on the other hand, if you have a block like this crystal is not allowed to heal uh, efficiently, then of course, uh, there is a residual strain, a stress releasing, uh, remaining in the crystal. And that um, leads to, of course, reduction in the anisotropy as we observe. So this is what uh, we have stated, of course, in the paper, that penalty in the structural order and alignment with crystallographic precision is therefore favorable. So this is, these all are complemented by both the Kelvin Pro measurements and the PG force microscopy measurements. We are currently actually planning a detailed photoelastic measurements to actually quantify those and confirm those. So with this, before I stop, uh, I just uh, add to what Malla has uh, told about its potential applications. It has, of course, extraordinary cell filling properties. That's what uh, is important. But at the same time, it has very strong piezoelectric property, of course. Strong polarization and isotopic uh, property. Lot of optical devices needs that. Photoelasticity is manifested, as we said, that uh, photoelastic effect is also there. Then it is a non centrosymmetric crystal. So it has to have nonlinear optical properties. We had also seen some OU guiding properties. So the piezoelectric response itself, as Malla has told, many useful applications because piezoelectric materials are used in daily life to industry and to even in scientific instrumentation. All the precision measurement that you do, uh, where you need a precision control of a stage, precision control of some probe, like all the probe microscopies. So there you need a piezoelectric. So here it can actually uh, lead to useful applications. Many, it can actually dramatically change many things. 
it can be used as a transducer actuator sensors and of course as malla said uh, smart biomaterials and tissue engineering because as uh, malla was mentioning that uh, these uh, connective tissues like collagen etc has exactly the same uh, same uh, nature that when you apply pressure they generate electricity and that this is called mechano transduction so that electricity uh, that electric signal actually triggers a number of pathways to do the healing so this is exactly what it can be useful in tissue engineering from our point of view we are of course optical scientists so we think that this may lead to a no novel self healing photonic material and it may have some useful implications in integrated nanophotonic on chip integrable photonic devices because it has all the important photonic and optical properties like in sensors modulators filters opticals and isolators we'll see if we can as professor pal uh, said that uh, there is a lot of translational potential we'll see that if we can actually realize it, at least few of those thank you so maybe we can take questions both together if uh, as we maybe we can stand here that okay. will be better so let's take actually quest few questions from the audience so if one of us can take a microphone nah. okay so can i ask a question yeah sure uh, anyway congratulations both of you for the fantastic work and the beautiful presentation so uh, you know as malla i think uh, stressed a couple of times uh, that uh, if you have crystals they are usually not self healing and i think it makes lot of sense from a thermodynamic point of view because crystal is an ordered material which has low entropy and if you break it you increase the entropy and the laws of thermodynamics tells you you should not move naturally should not move from you know high entropic state to low entropic state you can stay constant or entropy should increase that is the arrow of time for us actually right? that is what thermodynamic laws tell us so it's a very strange situation where you are naturally healing and if it is a crystal you are essentially restoring order right so you are naturally going towards a state which is less entropic so to thinking about it one would imagine that there must be a way in which the system is getting rid of this excess energy uh, and heating itself up for example so is there any sign of that that's my question i mean first of all it's very strange that it is going towards a crystal should not go towards an you know healing because it's reducing the entropy of the whole system no but but uh, yeah. that there is a force which is acting right yes even because, if there is a force so it should not become ordered i mean you know it can stick itself but becoming ordered is something more than that it is not just like sticking yeah, together there are some some something might be there but at the same time see for example i was referring to photoelasticity yes in photoelasticity this exactly happens that if you apply pressure even in crystal so it actually leads to more ordered system like it can lead to change in an extra yes but that's understandable because, because then then it's you no know, normal as in that case it is driven by a force Yes, this is also driven by a force. So here, it's naturally happening. No, it's naturally, but no, but this is also driven by a force. The force is here that the when you let's say break it. When so I when say force, I mean external force. I'm trying to distinguish between an external force and the internal force. No, if but you, let me uh, let me tell you that when you break it, when you break it, that means actually, if you as I was showing the piezoelectric tensor, so you actually generate uh, charges in the opposite thing right so that is that's correct call it external or internal that will anyway tend to make them come together see when you put a pressure you are putting something from outside so this that is, is an internal internal pressure and i think what i'm trying to say a system in isolation if it follows thermodynamic principles it is strange to think that uh, you know its entropy will spontaneously reduce as a function of time it is kind of happening here it means basically it's somewhere dumping its energy somewhere else it's probably heating a little bit while it's organize itself and reducing its entropy so my question is this is something which you can probe or this is something beyond which you can probe at the present moment that's the question yeah okay i have a comment to show you that uh, there yeah. are two two important thermodynamic effects of course the yeah. entropy is what you are talking about and also but also there is an enthalpy yes so somewhere there is an enthalpy gain yes i think that's exactly what i am so there must yeah. be some thermal no, right. effect somewhere so i think that enthalpy so it is not that the system cannot be ordered at any time it can be ordered if there is enthalpy gain of yes. course i don't know where is the gain that 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 yes. is, maybe they would be able to answer that 
Yes, that's I what I'm curious. To, I just wanted to clarify that question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. So, uh, Shaurin, thank you very much. Uh, so actually, what happens when you bend, uh, when you break is, uh, you kind of uh, create some strain. Okay, uh, put some strain into the system. So once uh, you put some strain, there is, or you can say fatigue or plastic deformation, very slight plastic deformation. This means that uh, your molecules are not sitting in idealized position. So they uh, they are distorted a little bit. So you are putting energy into the system, right? When it is yes. moved away from the thermodynamic positions, the molecules, yes. so you put strain. So you uh, so that strain is here, uh, since it is a polar system, uh, so it is uh, basically leading to the charges. So when these uh, pieces come together and uh, join, so they then they basically uh, uh, also probably uh, increasing the order. So they are uh, slightly gaining the order. Yes, and, because uh, what you are saying is not only they put together, they actually put themselves together in a defectless way, which means they come back to an ordered state, which is a lower entropic fully, state. Not fully, but uh, to some extent, yeah. But yes. when, a large extent, what we actually. see is, you know, when uh, there is an imperfect healing, right? You know, if you have a crack, so we see the remnant charges, uh, you know, positive, negative across the surface, you know, the crack junction. And uh, we also see a large drop in the order parameter. So they, they mm -hmm. becomes even more. So in uh, case of, yeah, so that, but that is because you have stopped that naturally to heal. Right. But it kind but of yeah, makes, We have makes, to look at, look at. Yeah, what, I think what you said makes a lot of sense because they, I think an amorphous material will naturally be able to do this. But in a crystalline material, we'll have more difficulty from this perspective. That's, uh, I mean, that's what I was trying to hint at. Yeah, I think. Yeah. From so, a thermodynamic see, we, we need clarity, definitely. I think we need to discuss also uh, more, I think, there are uh, issues. But, yeah. Anyway, thanks again for the wonderful, wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's go to the next question. Soyan Bhattacharya. Soyan, you go ahead. Yeah, so there is some... Like, so first of all, uh, 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 Malla and also uh, uh, Nirmalo, thank you so, so much for presenting to us such a nice work. And a, a happy uh, Teacher's Day to both of you and to all my colleagues and uh, students. So my question is this, that Malla, uh, you said that, uh, that this uh, self-healing that is taking place, that is, is happening within milliseconds, right? So how you could make that possible the measurements like kpfm uh, like you have shown the charges positive and, net, uh, and the negative so on a time scale that it will heal up you might not see the separate uh, charges and also for the uh, the, uh, the uh, also that is applicable for also you know the other measurements as uh, as to, uh, to work well so and, how uh, do you make that work? yeah yeah science so when you basically break it and then leave it it, uh, when it heals so that is in the uh, less than second so so we looked at these uh, high speed camera frames and then we see that uh, the difference between uh, two frames is something like a millisecond okay so you see a crack then suddenly you don't see in the next frame so this is uh, very fast so definitely if you see it in the real time so it is less than a uh, second so these uh, kpfm and other experiments were done uh, by break suppose if you break the crystal into two pieces then you basically separate them and then you take one piece and mount and then check the uh, kpfm so then then you see the charges there okay so you, they, they, it's not that we allowed the crystal to heal so these charges are actually long lasting so it stay these charges stay for a couple of hours actually so what we did is we mounted a crystal and then uh, brave broken it after mounting properly after breaking it and then we put it on the instrument and within 15 minutes we could do the first measurement that is when we see these charges. So we have uh, tested multiple crystals. In some crystals, we see positive charge on the surface, on the on the plane, and then in the other case, we see the negative. So we don't know exact orientation. So the, if you know the orientation of the crystals, you could tell. Uh, you know, then if you see the phase indexing and correlate it with the crystal structure, you can tell uh, which surface is supposed to be positive and which surface surface is supposed to be negative. But here we could not do all those experiments actually. But we know. Uh, that you know, they, some surfaces are positive and some surfaces are negative. So again, the polarization measurements were also performed uh, after you break it to pieces. Of course, this uh, the healing that he is talking about, this is taken in a thousand frames per second video. So that I you see. cannot do any experiment with that. But uh, this, what we are saying that reduction in this thing, anisotropy or this thing, so that is actually on broken pieces, where it shows 
charges also potential in 45 minutes let's say one hour it remained and then it gradually decayed so same uh, the anisotropy measurements that order parameter measurements were also done after it is it was broken into pieces so if you uh, suppose if you, if you leave one well, suppose one part you know and don't uh, to join the other part how long the whatever the charges are how long they will stay on the surface so we see, we uh, checked and at least couple of hours uh, after couple of hours also you know, under air you know normal conditions we could still see the attraction sometimes i think uh, four to five hours still we saw something but with time okay. it definitely decreases and then we are doing experiments under different uh, you know uh, conditions like you know polar and non polar conditions so we see some difference so we have not yet published those but we definitely see that you know these charges also interact with the medium that you have and then the the lifetime of uh, you know these uh, decay is uh, different under different conditions okay so we will talk more maybe later so thank you so much and uh, all the best thank you Sushmita. Happy Teachers Day to both of you and all the teachers, uh, all the professors here. Uh, so uh, congratulations to both of you again for this beautiful work. Uh, I was just wondering that uh, have you uh, have you realized the, uh, the when there is a cracking and there is a charge separation, have you realized that uh, what is the length scale of this separation? Means if you crack it, and uh, how far from how far it is really realizing the two pieces really realizing the field effect yeah see we have not done a statistical analysis of that uh, we really don't know what is the maximum but uh, under limited tests we saw that even 50 micrometers if you if the crystals are away 50 micrometers still they can actually come closer and then uh, get attached okay. and this is just a comment about the thermodynamic viewpoint i think uh, when uh, you are separating means the chart separation is occurring uh, and then again it is having a self-healing uh, which is again like it's an enthalpically driven process because of the electrostatic interaction so there must be some release of your medium which is in between when the crack happened so uh, the, the, that's the release of entropy and that's where the system gains entropy. Uh, so what, what's that? And that's the thermodynamic law. In fact, delta G equals to delta H minus T delta S. So, so delta G rules the law. So what is releasing or what you presume? So I think uh, there is some change in the order, uh, I think, uh, definitely. Uh, so uh, if you see, if you have energy in the system, suppose if, if they become basically like order, right? So then you are losing the charges. So the charges are gone. So then you gain some order, right? So this, I think, explains partly. But then again, uh, with the Muller matrix, uh, we know up to uh, 300 nanometers resolution. But uh, then these are all at a molecular level. You know, very small change at molecular level can actually give you a big change in the, uh, you know, surface. Hello, I, think, I think I'm a little bit interact, uh, interrupting because here it seems like that your media also has a, because it's, uh, 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 Nirmaloda also has uh, seen a lot of anisotropic effect, dielectric anisotropy, and where media has to play a role. So, what's your media? So, what's your is, medium? So, media area? here is uh, air actually. We have also done in silicon oil. We have done under yeah, have, yeah. normal air, like okay. so atmospheric air. Thank you, Malala. Thank you. Thank you. Good oh, wonderful job. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, when the material broke, there was some energy which was required. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So I think that energy is somehow coming, really out, coming out again. That's the. I think it's the hand. Yeah. So the, so immediately because of charge electrostatic effects, some mm -hmm. enthalpy is wrong. Uh, and so the energy is coming out. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, think that's because we how apply. it's coming out in what form. I mean, because it is a very short time scale, but at least in so that, that is the question. Sorry, not the question. Sorry, not. I think that is a good question. Okay. Yeah. Somnath. So Somnath is one of the co-authors, so he has done the X-ray crystallography part. Yeah, Somnath. Yeah. He wants to make a comment. You know, but... no, happy teachers, sir, and uh, to everybody. Uh, 
my question is to Professor Ghosh uh, Nirmala, sir. Sir, uh, we are probing these four by four matrices, and uh, uh, this must follow the box theorem in crystals, right? And so you get zero, uh, zero or some finite components for each of the uh, uh, elements when you do probes on perfect crystalline order materials. No, I did not. So I did not get your point. Can you speak a little slow? Yeah. Sure. So uh, when you're probing uh, the Mula, uh, uh, estimating the Muller matrix elements on crystals, uh, I hope that some elements goes to zero. Yeah. 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 Because, uh, see, because... It depends, uh, yeah, it depends upon uh, what kind of effect you're looking at. Some elements will be zero, maybe. Okay. Okay. So basically, strictly it is following the Bloch's theorem, and you can replicate those experimentally. Yeah, so actually this uh, this experimental system sensitivity, we had a uh, rigorous uh, paper on that also, that was at what sensitivity we can measure. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you are working with such high numerical aperture, that is where you have very high resolution, sensitivity is compromised to an extent. Okay. And so we in had case a, of, hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, we had an account of that, that how much, let's say we are talking about an element in terms of just a number, fraction, let's say. So, of course, a polarization measurement is sensitive depending upon that, as you said very rightly, that the zero elements, how small are those, right? So, there are uh, other methods like people use modulation-based methods where you can go to that point zero 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 one kind of thing. But this is not a modulation-based method because if you want to do an imaging, you cannot do a modulation. So, these imaging methods will always have to compromise on that uh, sensitivity. So, typically in our system, it is of the order of 0 0.0304. That's what we can say in terms of number in elements. So if you have, let's say, a change in milli-degree, I'm telling you, just an optical rotation, so it will come as an element as cos, let's say, cos theta. So you can say that if it is in milli-degree, then the element value will come in 0 0.001 or something like that. Those milli-degree changes, perhaps, will not be able to detect it. Uh, will not be able to detect using this, take, uh, this our current listing. Uh, that is it, right? So because you have to have a compromise. Uh, because okay. we are also doing imaging at the same time. So you cannot so do then, much. So then in case of uh, very structural disorder, sometimes there are like very structural disorder. So you could in principle capture those components, I guess. Yeah, right? so, and, yeah, so that, is, right? that is of course a limit to that, that how, how small okay. you can capture. No, I mean, they, sometimes they along certain directions, they do have a lattice periodicity. But of course, in the other directions, they do not have. Mm. So then there should be non-zero uh, non elements, I guess, which yeah, are... Be, so see, I'm saying that zero element is important because see, that is that gives you the sensitivity. Let's say, for okay. example, if you have a change of point zero zero one in one element, that is also important, but you cannot resolve it. So that is what is called the sensitivity of a system. So that's what okay. I was telling. Okay. Okay, we'll have actually last question by Gautam. Gautam, go ahead. Okay, uh, congratulations to both of you. And I have a question to both of you. I mean, just uh, um, uh, ask um, um, Nirmala, you have done all these experiments in visible light, right? It's not time for it. It is in visible red. Basically, we choose red, red light. Six, so, six, so, 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 so the question I'm asking is a lot of questions about thermodynamic uh, enthalpy and all these things. So mm -hmm. can you, is it is there any possibility to look when you do the experiment and look at uh, image it using an infrared uh, camera? So that probably you can have a signature of uh, heat loss or and whatever. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. we actually, uh, right now, we are uh, building up a system for the uh, NIR at least region mm -hmm. because currently all the optics, etc., that we are, or the cameras, CCD camera, etc., they are optimized for um, 300 to 800 nanometer. Yes, yes. But we now have brought optics and other things so that we can build up something, go uh, deep into the NIR. Yeah. I mean, because okay. IR will be very difficult going mm -hmm. hard into IR. Yeah, but, but in IR also you can have some signatures, I think. Yeah, I think that is good. Uh, it's a good point that if you go into IR, yes, but yeah, we'll see. But in IR we are trying and we will do it because we have planning to move it to the NIR because a lot of interesting spectroscopic things are there in the NIR. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, now we are going towards the end of this. Ceremony. So I would like to. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So please. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to know when this material gets kind of cleaved. So there are local effects at that point. That's what Nirmalo is looking at the electrostatic polarization. I think suppose your molar matrix is sufficiently large that you can take hyperpolarizability, other orders of polarization, right? 
so that yeah so that for the, if, for example non linear measurements can give you about the higher order yeah. but but what happens at and this has effect also at slightly away from the point of wreckage yeah, yeah. so that is what we are saying that this like a field effect kind of thing so if you even move uh, around that crack junction you still have some disorganization yeah, and absolutely. slowly it, uh, there is a region of field effect then slowly it goes to the native value so you can you can see that when it heals it completely the rest of everything yeah. is set, yeah. so set, that, set that is what that figure i was showing that uh, this orientation microscopic orientation that's so a nice order over that there are some things there also like there was we are discussing there is like a kind of a periodic variations things like that which we still uh, could not understand that why is it coming in the hill crystal there was something said because this order comes like that this orientation is something like that so if it is like this so you say that it is has a long crystalline order but we saw something in the case of the improperly hill it was completely random but here you we saw some wavy like behavior also which we were discussing that what could that be yeah but, i just thought whether you are achieving the perfect order as in this original stuff uh -huh. In the case of perfect ordering, uh, we don't see any unusual changes uh, at the crack. In the crack, right? yes. so it's almost like uniform, like uniform in that region. So maybe when you go to the uh, other parts, you know, far away from that, then maybe that would be. I think that is closer to the native form. Yes, yes. But then at a uh, closer to the crack junction, so it is little drop. Right. There is a little drop, but it is uniform. Yes. But in case of uh, imperfectly healed one, where you see the crack, it goes you know, down completely. Here it is like totally that. like you know, it's uh, completely like a. It falls down. Maybe there is something, some you know, which maybe we could not resolve. That also can happen. There may be some small uh, resting that may also happen. Okay, I invite now. Okay, so thank you, Mala and Ninwala, for the nice thank talk. You. And let's actually clap. And I invite now Professor Pandey to give concluding remarks. Okay, so very beautiful talk. We can see the advantage of having a public talk because, to be very honest, I could understand almost all of it from both of you. Now, also, you see the need for you know mathematics, like for example, vector, tensor, and all those things. See, very practical need you saw right here, and without that, you cannot really characterize this kind of system. So, and optics, particularly with all this polarization, is really a beautiful subject, and many many. New applications will come up. For example, Neil Ramanujan is talking about weight measurement, all those things. Now, I would like to also point out that uh, you see all these sophisticated mathematics and optics has uh, resulted in a very beautiful award for Nimalio. This GG Stokes award. You see the Stokes parameter, those four elements he mentioned. They are very practical observational parameters, namely intensity, intensity difference, then these two you know phases, which basically polarization and uh, difference uh, in uh, you know, left and right, and Mueller matrix is the one which told us how it propagates. And you saw Jones, that paper, 1948, and uh, in a you know, different kind of material where we call it like you know mixed state in quantum and other things. Exactly same mathematics. So what has been described here can really go over. Nimali is talking about weak, uh, you know, quantum weak measurement. Slowly, many of us are venturing into that area. So this beautiful Stokes award, you can see the. Practical application of that. So, uh, congratulations to Nimalia, and uh, you know this uh, not only for this, also for the Stokes Award. And uh, coming back to Mala, it is not lost upon us that today is uh, Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan's birthday, and uh, Mala pointed out a paper with Desi Raju, Professor Desi Raju. So, for all of you who are curious, you should find out that why Desi Raju spent his childhood in the Rashtrapati Bhavan with Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. And it is only apt to mention that Mala is receiving this one. So very beautiful piece of work. Yeah, thank you. Just one. So I would like to mention that uh, on every occasion, on public occasion, after Professor Paul came here, we try to honor the people who have contributed to many aspects of the institute, this time to the academic program. And uh, there are two individuals. You know, Rana Bhadra, you must have heard about Rana Bhadra. The other is Devajyoti, you know, uh, Adak. So, academic session. And they have really contributed significantly during this pandemic period. So, 
of course, uh, they are not here, and Professor Paul will specifically give them the certificate and some uh, as our a token award honoring their contribution. And uh, there were six of them who got all year all the, all year occasions. They will also be given certificate and cash awards later on in Professor Paul's office. Thank you. time for the vote of thanks. I wholeheartedly I would like to actually thank Professor Paul for the for actually supporting this ceremony and also leading from the front and for this academic activity. And also I would like to thank all the Dean, Associate Dean and all the HODs for their support. And I would like to thank the computer center and the audio visual unit, Said Saikat, Rajat, and Samal, who are actually in the behind of this program, are actually contributing a lot for the direct telecast and YouTube channel uh, telecast. And I would like to also add uh, Abhijit from the director's office, who has actually channelized all the all works actually behind this thing. And I also like to add the name of um, volunteers, Athira and uh, Nirmiti, who is actually here and contributed to the whole activity. I would like to thank all the faculty, staff, and the students for their support and encouragement and be present in this online and in the offline talk. Thank you, everybody. Before I close, I must thank Professor Panigrahi and Professor Sattabrata Raj I mean, for taking the real initiatives for, the, for organizing it. I think they deserve all the credit. Thank you. Thank you.